But I mean, I've walked into homes before where, you know, there was like seven kids locked in a cellar sleeping on a single mattress and just filthy covered cockroaches. Welcome back to Other People's Lives. I'm Joe Sanigato. I'm Greg Dybeck. For anyone out there that wants to be a guest on our show, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our email is oplpodcast at gmail.com. So just send us an email and we'll get back to you. Yeah, and super quick shout out to all the OPL patrons out there. You can head over to patreon.com slash OPL show. And we've been using the monthly Patreon money to donate to different charities, different causes, sometimes previous guests. So uh, if you want to be part of that, your kind of monthly donation will eventually go towards the charities that we choose. So that's patreon.com slash OPL show. And today we're speaking with a woman who is a child protection worker for child protective services. She reached out to us to share some insight about her job. It's a job that a lot of us know exists, but probably choose to not consider the details of. And as always, we've got our guests on the line and we're looking forward to learning more about the job. So firstly, thanks for being on today. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Yeah. So to start, can you give us your definition of what a child protection worker does for a living? So there's a few different roles, but my specific role is to investigate families that um, are being looked at for abusing children. Uh, And there's many, many definitions of abuse, Uh, but I'm the frontline worker. I'm the first person that people see after we get a call from the police or the school or anyone who has worries about a child in danger. Interesting. Uh, So I guess, you know, uh, one of the things that popped in my head when when we were going to do this episode was of all the times that like you hear of kids threatening their parents being like, I'm going to call CPS or or do something like that. Like it, I, I don't know. I guess it's just like a personal question for me. Like, does this happen? Does that happen as often as you hear? Cause I feel like the only time that I really hear about it is like people saying it in a joking manner and like, I'm going to call, like, I know it's a very serious thing and like, obviously you guys are doing, you know, great things, but, uh, is that something that happens a lot? Do children call? Uh, oh, yeah, it happens constantly where we get kids who teenagers, the big thing right now is teenagers who, you know, may identify as a different gender or they're struggling with themselves. They'll say, you know, if you don't accept me or you don't let me live with my boyfriend, I'm going to call CPS on you and have them put me somewhere where I want to be, whether you like it or not, or I'm going to tell them you're beating me just so I don't have to live here anymore. It happens all the time. And so with with something like that, like, you know, can you kind of go through what, you know, the, uh, the process is? So if someone calls you, do you, no matter what, you have to go check it out, I assume. Yes. So it's just like the police. If you were to call the police and say, hey, you know, somebody's breaking into my house, they can't just say, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Uh, Same thing. We have to report when it's a child who may be in danger. So especially in situations where you can kind of tell the child might be trying to use their parents um, against us, we'll go out. I'll sit down with the parents, talk about why I'm there. And they'll, they'll tell me that they're having issues with the child's behavior. That's a really big one is child behavior issues. But in that situation, I always privately interview every child in the house. So a lot of the times the child that's having issues or the child that calls and says, my parents are beating me. I want to leave. They'll usually have siblings and I interview all children privately. So a lot of the times what I get told is no, my brother, Billy, he just, he's trying to get out of here. He doesn't want to be here. He wants to live with his girlfriend. My parents don't beat us. You know, we get put in a timeout or we get sent to our rooms, but that's not true. Um, I also do a lot of follow-up with police. We do record checks. I call schools. I call family doctors. So these people all have a duty to report to us if they have concerns about a child's safety. But I will call the school and say, hey, have you ever had concerns with Billy? Has he ever come to school with bruises on him? He's telling me that his parents are beating him every day. So have you noticed any issues? Things like that. Mm, Okay. So you're kind of reaching out to everyone possible to kind of understand the story and what's going on. And what are the, so I guess that's one instance where you're getting a call that's made by a child. Um, What are some other cases? You mentioned doctors, I guess, teachers. Uh, What are other like calls that you get or, or who's making these calls? 
So school teachers is huge. Um, they're constantly calling about children with bruising on them. Uh, family doctors constantly calling us, police officers. A big thing with COVID, I have to say, is domestic violence was really, really bad. And we were getting calls from police officers more than daily just with issues of kids being involved in their parents' violent altercations, pretty much, whether mm. it be between them or seeing it in general. Like, we don't want kids being exposed to any adult conflict. Right. But really, okay. anyone who cares for a child can call us. Like, I've had grandparents call me and say, hey, you know, my son's doing drugs and my grandkids are in danger. You need to go out and you guys need to do something about it. Mm. Yeah. And I guess, you know, what what is... You know, because uh, I'm assuming like the the quote unquote worst thing that can happen is that you have to take the child from these parents or their living condition yeah. or whatever the case may be. Uh, so before that point, is there sort of like warnings along the way or is there like other things that, you know, you have people come in and do like checks to make sure everything's OK or something like that? Or is it always kind of resulting in taking a child away if there is something going on and it's enough to warrant a call then does that usually result in like a child being removed from that situation so it absolutely can be normally we will do everything to work with the parent to avoid that happening like that is such a traumatic thing for any child to go through is being removed from their parents so we always talk to the parent like what can we do to avoid this happening you know if you're really messed up on cocaine or meth or whatever today can they stay with their grandparents while you try to get clean and we work through safety planning can we do check-ins well we'll never never leave a child in the care of a parent who's under the influence of something but you know who can check in who can come here who can stay with you can grandma come over for the weekend to make sure that your children are safe in your care but i mean i've walked into homes before where you know there was like seven kids locked in a cellar sleeping on a single mattress and just filthy covered cockroaches and the kid can't stay, those kids can't stay in that situation. So it was the conversation with the parent, like, okay, so this isn't okay. What are you, where, where can I put this child? Because you and I both know your kids can't stay here. This is unacceptable. And do you have cousins, grandparents, family members, aunts, uncles, like where can these kids go? And if the kids can't go to any family members or they really don't have anyone, then we do have to resort to foster homes. Wow. So that's like horrific to hear. Do parents ever try to fight you and say like, no, our, my kid's staying here. And then if that's the case, if they're really against their kid going anywhere, but it's clearly sort of an emergency situation like that, like abuse or a child not being fed or like living conditions that aren't sanitary. Um, what are your steps to kind of like expedite that process to get the kid somewhere safe? If the parent's not willing to cooperate. So if the parent's not willing, I mean, there's been some incidents with coworkers of mine where they like grab the worker, they lock them in the basement too. And they're like, you are not going anywhere. Luckily, nothing like that's ever happened to me. I've been able to like escape from homes, call police, have backup there. Um, when it comes to child protection, we have more jurisdiction over kids and safety than police do. So if I say like, you need to knock down that door, there's kids in there that need to come out. They have to do it. They don't need a warrant if I'm telling them to do it. I don't need a warrant to do those things. And that's oh, wow. Of, yeah. A lot of people don't know that, but um, if there's a child in danger, I don't need a warrant to remove them. And we put them in foster homes while we work with the parents to better find a spot for them or try to get the parents back on track. But yeah, I've had a lot of situations like that. Where do calls usually come from, if not from, you know, because like, I mean, the example that you gave, like there's like seven kids sleeping in a cellar on one mattress, like I'm assuming none of the children or the parents. So like where, where do phone calls usually kind of come from? So in that situation, it was a neighbor who had seen that there was kids living there but never saw them. They said like, we've seen the kids once in about three months. We saw them go in, but we never saw them come out. Um, we've, I've had neighbors call because they've heard kids screaming and they don't know why, like, does the kid have autism? And um, that's how they communicate. Or is there a child being beaten in that home? And that was the situation where I showed up to this house. I ended up going into this very scary basement and found all these children. Jeez. In a case like that, like, you know, to, to Joe's point, like a kid's not calling in that situation. So when you end up 
in a circumstance like that are some are the kids just completely unaware sometimes like for them if it's abuse a broken home something like that if that's all they know and you're kind of talking to a kid are they like I guess what I'm asking is how do you kind of pick up from a kid what's going on if for them the abuse or those living conditions are normal to them and all they know absolutely so that specific living condition was awful and that story that I have, those kids were actually almost all nonverbal. They couldn't speak wow. and they weren't being seen by doctors. So there was no way of me interviewing them to figure out if this was a normal thing or not. Um, but one thing I will say is that everyone has their own definition of normal and it does not match from person to person. Like for me, normal was, you know, you get in trouble, you get grounded. That's, that was how I got in trouble growing up. But the families I work with think that, you know, breaking their kid's leg is a form of normal. And, you know, if I don't like my kid, I'll just kill them. Like I've seen that happen. So it really, it really differs. I've had parents who like actively put their kids into sex work and say like, what do you mean? This isn't normal. This is how I, my mom made money growing up. It happens. And it happens right next to you. Like that's one of the scariest things for me growing up was realizing how naive I was as a child and, my parents really did a good job protecting me, but knowing like now the community I live in, that there's child predators everywhere. They are your neighbors. They are your family members. They are friends of yours. You have no idea, but they are there. It's uh, wow. terrifying to hear. Yeah, that is. <laughs> um, also, I had a question of, you know, I guess what would constitute as, like, what would warrant you guys uh, to remove a child, I guess, when it comes to um, beating a child? Like, for instance, if a parent uh, hit their child and there wasn't, like, a habit of it, but it did happen, uh, and you guys are called and you show up to the house and that story is sort of verified that it was maybe like an isolated incident or something like that, like, what, what is the protocol for that? Yeah, that happens all the time where we go out, we find out that, you know, dad spanked a child and you can spank a kid as long as it's open hand on the bum over clothes. It crosses the line when you start to leave handprints, because that means you're using like excessive force. It crosses the line when you start to bruise your child. Like I've seen full hand print bruises on kids' faces, on their arms. You can see like certain fleshy parts of kids' bodies where bruises shouldn't be. They'll be showing up that's when it crosses the line into excessive force and can cause like internal bleeding. And parents sometimes don't realize how forceful they're being, but if you're not leaving marks and it's on the bum over pants, then it's one of those things I say, it's not illegal, but we don't recommend it. And I would oh. never take it away from- I didn't know there were like guidelines for spanking. Yeah, yeah, there are. Wow. Uh, I know we kind of just jumped into, you know, so many stories already uh, of some of the things that you see. So I just have to like, take a second to ask, is this something that you always wanted to get into? Because I think for a lot of people, uh, it wouldn't even be a consideration knowing what you may be exposed to, because even just hearing this, I mean, abuse related to children is just one of the most horrific things that you can hear be exposed to. Uh, so for you, like what made you take that step to knowing that this is something that you could deal with on a daily basis? Honestly, it was never a job I expected getting into. I went to university. I have like a background in psychology and social work. And my end goal was working with like people with addiction. That's what I wanted to do. And I ended up getting this job right out of school thinking like, oh, it's just going to be a temporary thing. But then I ended up falling in love with helping kids like there's a lot of times where you know families tell you you're the devil and you're horrible and you're the worst person on earth but there's also really good success stories where putting kids in foster homes and letting them see what maybe my version of normal would have looked like growing up and having a taste of what life can look like is really worth it in the end but it's a struggle there's so many days where you know you drive home from work crying because of the horrific things that you see kids dying or parents actively trying to harm kids it's awful the worst is sexual abuse parents sexually exploiting children or not believing their children once they've been sexually exploited mm. and, and yeah i mean 
these are all like wild situations that I, I imagine, you know, you would kind of put yourself in a dangerous situation. I, uh, the way that you're describing, like finding those children in their basement and like cockroaches everywhere, like that would freak me out. Like if I like walked down there, I'd be like, well, clearly I'm dealing with parents who are like, you know, maybe nuts and like will hurt me because oh they think that I'm going to take the, like, how do you protect yourself in these situations? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm messing with the worst thing you can, which is people's children. They always say, don't mess with money and children. And I mess with both of those if I remove somebody's children. Because that's sometimes their only way of making money is by having children and, you know, using the child tax benefit. But my husband, he is terrified for my safety. Like every single day, he's like, you got to change your job. Like you're not going to come home one of these days because it happens. Um, I am from Canada, so I think it's a little bit different. I do feel lucky that I'm not in the States because I'm hearing about, you know, social workers in the States constantly walking into somebody's house and getting knifed, getting gunned down. Uh, gun laws are very different here, but I still go in homes all the time and I see gun safes and I'm looking things up and making sure somebody's not coming up behind me. We have protocols, but we're not allowed to have any weapons on us. So my job is to walk in with my hair in a bun and always have, uh, like, look at my escape routes. How am I going to get away? Can I talk this person down? Is this person on drugs? Are they going to assault me whether I, you know, am able to talk them down or not? I had a schizophrenic man who had a break while I was there and I wasn't even there to take the kid. I was actually just there to have a conversation about schooling and, you know, what resources I could connect him with. And he had a full, like, psychotic break while I was there. And it was a scary situation. And I got out there fast. Are you alone when you enter these homes? Oh, yeah. My husband hates that, too. Wow. Even if you're taking a child, you're by yourself. So in that situation, if I go into a home knowing, like, if the referral that comes in is really, really bad, and I think there's absolutely no way these kids can stay here, or the police give me a lowdown, like, oh, this is a bad home they'll come with me. If I know I'm taking a kid, I always take police, but there's situations like that cockroach one where the kids were in the basement. Like I had no idea. It was just about, you know, not seeing kids. So I wondered if kids even lived there. Like I wasn't sure. So I did go into that situation alone and I quickly called police to, for backup. Mm -hmm. And you said that you can't have any weapons. Are you able to carry pepper spray or something that could be used defensively if needed or nothing at all? Unfortunately, no. As far as I know, pepper spray is actually illegal in Canada. I think bear spray is legal here, but pepper spray is not. Wow. My husband thinks it's hilarious, but I always have a corkscrew in my purse because I like wine. So he's like, you better have a couple <laughs> of those. Like, do not let somebody get behind you. So, yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. I mean, that walking into each new home, like, is, is that something that you ever get comfortable with? Or are you always on edge? Is there always just a, a kind of baseline level of anxiety? Oh, always. Like a lot of the times I don't even call these people before I go. So wow. imagine you as a parent, I show up at your door and say, Hey, I got a call because I heard you could be beating your kid. Can we talk? So already you're on edge and I'm on edge because I'm showing up at your door unannounced. And a lot of the other dangers that come with a job is things like dogs or weird exotic pets that people might have. I mean, I had a family I work with the other day have three of the biggest English Mastiffs I've ever seen in my entire life. And like one of them could have killed me with a bark. Like it's things like that. Like, please put your dogs away. We need to have a conversation and I don't want to be attacked by your animals. Yeah, seriously. Wow. Yeah, that is, that is wild to kind of think about that. You have to like go into these places like by yourself and, you know, sometimes with the police, but I, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like, so uh, like you, you said, you, when you, when you walk into a situation, you're like, okay, I definitely have to take these kids. There's never a time where you leave and then have to come back. You, you like, is it part of the protocol of your job to be like, if you walk in and you find out that these children are in a bad situation, you can't leave without taking them. Yeah. We have to be able to have a plan before the day's out, whether that means like I stay until three o'clock in the morning trying to plan with these parents. Yeah. I have to be able to stay unless they're able to give me an explanation as to why, you know, the child's bumped and bruised and it's like an actual real explanation. If there's no explanation and we're worried about a child's safety, I have to say like, I'm sorry, you need to have somebody else stay with you and watch you or let's take the kids to grandma's for the weekend. And how do you verify these stories? Like, uh, it's, you know, 
because this is <laughs> my nephew recently <laughs> like fell off the stairs in front of my sister's home and he like had a cut on his head and like on his face a little bit. Yep. So she, she brought him to the hospital, but she's like, I swear to God, like, she's like, it's shit like this that scares me because, uh, you know, it just like looks bad. So like, how, how can you, especially with children who are nonverbal and they're young, yep. um, how can you verify stories and, and know that, you know, parents aren't lying, that she didn't like push them or, you know, like how, how can you, uh, you know, sort of prove those things if there is no like cameras or whatever, it's really just this person's word and a child that can't speak for itself. So this is where it gets hard. And the reason that siblings are an amazing thing, because again, we do private interviews with children, like all children in the house. So an incident that happened to me pretty recently was we got a call from a day camp that said, we have a child who is like bruised. He has autism. He's completely nonverbal. We have no idea, but we're getting really, really bad feelings. We don't know what to do. The bruising is not in a normal spot. Like it was all the way down the side of his body. So super scary. So luckily this child had a sibling and who was verbal. I was able to have a conversation with the child and they were able to tell me like, oh, you know, Billy fell the other day and they were able to describe like how they fell off the deck and where it happened and what happened. So I thought, okay, well, that's good. I talked to the parent and the parent described the same story. This is what happened. Um, this was the incident. What I do is I take photos of the bruising or marks or burns or whatever might happen. And luckily I live in a very big city. So I'm able to send them off to, we have like physicians who specialize in abnormal marks, bruises, burns, anything like mm -hmm. that. And they will look at the photos and say, oh yeah, that totally matches with the story. That looks like, you know, a kid got cut on the pavement. That looks like the kid, you know, went over their handlebars and hit their chest. Um, but they mm -hmm. also do full like lookovers sometimes of children because we notice abnormal things. So sometimes a kid might have a totally normal bruise on their shins, but then you might notice that they are like bruised on the back of their ear, which is a really odd spot to have bruising or, you know, they have broken bones that aren't, the parents aren't able to identify what happened or the stories are inconsistent. And that's when stuff gets fishy is when stories start to get mixed up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh... It's funny you say that, Joe, because <laughs> I, I have a one month old daughter at home and which as a complete side note makes hearing this a million times worse. And I already could not stand hearing anything related to child abuse. And this just brings up a, a new level of just disgust. And like, I almost want to say hatred for people who do it. Um, I don't even want to keep talking about it. I could like literally cry thinking about it, but it was funny because the early on when we had her, we were like trying to pull a onesie that had a zipper like over her head and like the zipper made the faintest like scratch on her head. And I think we had a doctor's appointment the next day and we were freaking out. We're like, and looking back, you could barely see it, but we're like, Oh my God, is the doctor going to think like we cut her or did something. And I say that because I think that there is a stigma around what you do. And I don't know where this kind of, what the origin of this is, or if it's kind of comes from the families. Um, but there is sort of a stigma or controversy of, well, they're just, they're not going to do the due diligence. They're just going to uh, try to break up families or take a kid from you. Have you kind of experienced that? Or, or I guess, what do you have to say about that kind of stigma that exists? Oh yeah. All the time. I mean, I go into homes for things like, actually, I had an infant very recently who had a very abnormal bruise. We went in, um, turned out the child had a blood clotting disorder that the doctor wasn't aware of. And we were able to really easily verify that the parent wasn't abusing the child. Um, but I mean, I have parents all the time that say, you know, all you do is come in and take kids, you remove them. But at the end of the day, I don't work for parents. I work for children. And my end goal is child safety. And again, my definition of normal is different than other people's. But we do have... Of what we have to follow, like there's codes that we use for certain different types of abuse and there's lines that we can't cross. And if a child falls under a child in need of protection, we can't just leave them there. Mm -hmm. But don't worry if you get involved. If, as long as you're being honest, you have nothing to worry about. Is there any situation where 
a child could be removed just for a certain period of time and then placed back into the care of people? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So sometimes parents will willingly consent to have their kids removed for a period of time while they work on their sobriety or, you know, get rid of maybe a partner who's abusing them and the kids are witnessing it or anything like that. Um, I mean, I've seen kids, like I said, go to grandma's for the weekend, or maybe they stay with their grandparents for a month while the grandparents supervise a parent's access. Um, But sometimes parents aren't willing to let that happen. And they say like, we're not working with you voluntarily. In that case, we do have to get a court order to work with families and a judge will grant us to remove a child and have supervised access with the parent at our discretion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that is good to hear because there is sort of that, attempt at rehabilitation or, or create getting the circumstance right for a child to be reunited. Do you, and do you see that happen often where a child's able to successfully get reunited with families and then there's no follow-up cases? Yes, that happens all the time too, which is great. I've worked with families, some for four years in a row and like they make amazing progress and I get to see like parents and kids really, really bond and parents get over their addiction and really focus on their child. But sometimes it takes longer for some people than others. Um, But seeing a kid be able to go home with their parents and not have another case called with CPS is one of the best feelings in the world. Knowing that you've got to connect this family with so many resources that they don't feel the need to use or um, anything like that. It's awesome. Mm. Wow. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good way to look at it. It's, you know, it's not just coming in to take, it's coming in to provide assistance and sometimes people need help or resources that they didn't have access to prior. So that, that is good to hear. Also, what, what is the protocol for, you know, you show up and you tell them why you're, they're there, they either, they won't talk to you or they won't let you in the house or the siblings won't talk to you. Um, are they like, obligated by law to speak to you or like what how do you kind of get around that sort of hurdle so those situations are difficult because when it happens often that i'll show up and they'll say like screw you screw cps no way am i talking to you get out of here um in that case we do have to bring police back and usually that's enough for somebody to say like okay you can talk to my child we can have this conversation if they're really forceful and say like absolutely not it doesn't matter what you do you're not coming in here um if i'm not worried about the child's like imminent safety i will go to a judge get a warrant which does not take very long and i will have the child removed so i can have that conversation with them even if it's temporary even if it's for a few hours or um if the child is like in imminent danger and the referral is so bad that i can't trust leaving that kid there and they won't let me talk to that kid or see that kid that child's coming with me and that's the situation where i tell that officer you knock down the door i have to get that kid that child needs to come with me and i can have that conversation with the parent when they're ready but that child's not staying here okay um i have a two-part question so you've given us some i guess specific details and instances um, but what would you say is one of the most heartbreaking experiences that was really difficult for you to handle? And then uh, what was one of the most rewarding outcomes that you've experienced with your job? So I've had a few, I mean, there's a lot of really sad incidents, but any, any child I see die or almost die, whether intentional by the parent or not is one of the worst. And any parent who exploits their child for like sexual gain is just the most disgusting thing in the entire world. Um, I've worked with families for years who really don't understand why it's not okay to let stepdad, you know, rape a child repeatedly. Um, And those are the most like heartbreaking. Like those are the ones where I leave the hospital, like crying the whole way home, because how could a parent let that happen to their child knowingly um, and not believe their child? I see that so often. Like one of the biggest things I always say to parents is, like communicate with your kids. If they're telling you something, listen to them. Um, a lot of the times I see, like for instance, moms who believe stepdad over their child who's telling them that they've been sexually abused. Mm. And the parent just say like, no, he would never do that. My partner's wonderful. That's just awful. I've seen parents purposely kill their children or attempt to do that. 
those are gut wrenching um, or like cause injuries to their kids, broken bones. I've seen babies with broken bones and babies shouldn't have broken bones, right? Like at that stage, you're responsible for that child. And if a child has broken bones, then something's gone wrong. Those are definitely some of the worst. Um, I mean, there's also a lot of happy instances where I get to see, again, children reunite with parents after years. Um, I saw one incident where a mom and a dad didn't have a custody order and the dad was a frequent drug user. And one night he had the kid for a visit and he took off. He fled the country. Like he took the, I believe the child was three years old. He took the child to like Amsterdam and he just like traveled Europe. And the mom was calling police saying like, he took my kid. And the police said, I'm sorry, like you don't even have a custody order. How do we know that he's not a safe person? And they couldn't find this guy. Years later, he ended up coming back to the area, living there. And a school teacher called us on a whim and just said, hey, I've got some issues with this dad. You guys should come check it out. And it happened to be this missing kid for years. And the dad was completely cracked out when I got there. And it was a really awful situation. But I got to call the mom and I got to tell her that her child was there. And seeing that mom reunite with that child, I believe it was five years. Like the child was like eight Wow! when she got to see him and seeing them reunite was like, Oh, my God. it just brings tears to your eyes. Right. To see something like that. But the first thing she did was went and got a custody order just so you know. Um, so that's super important too. Yeah. I mean, I imagine like you see the, the good and bad with this job. I mean, mostly the bad, I mean, yeah. No matter no matter what, it's bad. But the in in you know instances like this where you are able to, you know, it, it's unfortunate situations, but you are helping and and doing a, a great thing, um, because I mean you know children, especially at a young age, like they they can't they don't know better. You know, like you said, sometimes they don't know that they're in a bad situation. It's like this is just what my life has been since I can remember anything. Um, so definitely need someone to be sticking up for them. And I think it's, you know, it, it's probably, although you're putting yourself in a very <laughs> compromising position and, uh, you know, you deal with a lot of sort of heartbreaking situations, it also at the same time has to be rewarding to know at the end of the day that you are making like an immediate difference uh, with these things. Absolutely. And I mean, I see a lot of funny things too. Like kids say the funniest things I mean obviously you guys have kids nieces nephews all that and like when I talk to kids they just say hilarious stuff like I'm pretty sure I have I've had so many kids whisper like death threats to me and it's weird in the moment but later you kind of have to laugh about it like I'm pretty sure I had a kid hex me once and like was doing witchcraft in their bedroom it's I see super weird things but kids are hilarious and they say really funny things (laughs) Um, I am curious, you know, with, with all this said, uh, because I I think it's important for people to hear. I think there's a lot of jobs, um, and, and day-to-day responsibilities that people have where they are, um, experiencing a lot of trauma or, you know, similar situations that you are. So how do you personally handle that trauma that comes with a job like this? It's rough. So at first I really had to like, I got very much into, I wasn't able to differentiate between work and my home life. Like I was really bringing it home with me at first. It's hard not to come home and just break down and cry when you see the types of things that I see in a day. But I really had to come to the point where I said to myself, like, after 5 p.m., I have to live my life. I can't let all this trauma come home with me or I will never have, you know, a successful marriage or have a successful family if I'm so busy wrapped up in the lives of these other kids and families. Um, I do a lot of kickboxing and self-defense courses, obviously. Good. (laughs) Um, but it's just pretty much really being able to separate myself. But honestly, if I didn't have like the managing staff that I do at the agency and some of the coworkers I do, I really don't know how I would get through this job. I feel very lucky for the people, the wonderful men and women that I surround myself with at this agency. Yeah, I'm sure a support system is is huge for something like that, where you're able to, you know, talk out what you're feeling with people who, you know, can truly understand what you're going through and seeing. Yeah, and that's the hard thing, too. Other than you guys, I really, I can't talk about these stories. I can't Mm. come home and, you know, tell my family the stuff that I see on a daily basis, because one, they wouldn't really understand. 
And two, it's not the responsibility and there's nothing they can do about it. Right. Whereas at work, I can talk to coworkers and, you know, we can talk about how to problem solve and just talk about our crazy, crazy days that some people will never have to experience. And that's a good thing. Yeah. And I, I guess like as, as we're coming to the, the end here, you know, I think one thing that's sort of important that we should end with is, you know, the sort of the protocol for people, if they see something that is off or what things they should be looking for um, that would warrant a call to you guys? Like, is there anything specifically that, uh, you know, if someone sees this, then they should probably call or, you know, or how to even go about that? Um, or I like, mean, find, you know, I yeah. would say in general, if you ever have a worry about a child's safety, better to be safe than sorry. Like I've had people who don't call because they don't think there's any issues and then later on a child ends up dead and that's always worst case scenario but it's better to say hey you know little billy had an odd bruise on him at school today can you go check it out and i'll go out and maybe it's nothing and i close it after one visit or maybe i find out that the parents are like super addicted to drugs and they like beat the heck out of this kid on a daily basis so if you're ever worried just call better safe than sorry and have somebody go out and see these kids yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I think that's great advice. And uh, we appreciate you sharing the details of the job, uh, you know, reliving some of the things that you've seen. But it's also uh, really good to hear that you're kind of able to, you know, find it so rewarding at the same time as you should, uh, because that is work that not every person, I think, would be equipped to handle. Um, so it's it's good to hear that you're out there, you know, truly making a difference. So we really thank you for that. And we thank you for coming on today. Thanks guys. I appreciate your time. Yeah. Have course, a good thank one. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. If I can get personal for a second, there's a lot of times in my life as a creator, business owner, husband, father, where I fall into the trap of focusing on problems rather than solutions. There are so many daily unforeseen challenges that can arise. And I found that since starting therapy, I've been able to better handle a lot of these obstacles and find solutions quicker without letting the stress of a situation spiral out of control. I'm a super ambitious person. I'm often juggling so many things at once and being able to remain in control of my mindset and develop tools to problem solve and reflect is honestly the main reason that I started therapy. It's helped me with anxiety, stress, and being more present in key moments. So if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can even switch therapists at any time. And OPL listeners can visit betterhelp.com slash OPL today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash OPL and get 10% off your first month. You want to know the scariest thing this Halloween? Being hairy in places that you don't want to be hairy. Luckily, our friends at Manscaped launched their fourth generation performance package to make sure your pumpkin gets the ultimate carving experience on this spooky day. Turn your bite-sized treat to a king-sized candy and join the 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code OPL. Make the right call this spooky season. It's trick or trim. And personally, I use Manscaped. And I'm going to be super honest. Before I used Manscaped, um, how can I put this? I would, I would injure the jewels. Uh, sometimes things would get bloody down there. I'm being honest being serious, but with Manscaped Performance Package 4.0, you won't have this problem. They have technology that helps prevent nicks, snags, tugs in those delicate holes, so you are safe to craft that masterpiece down below. They have a ton of products to check out for the perfect, ultimate grooming experience. Uh, if you're not using Manscaped by now, it's 
that that it's pretty wild to me. I don't know what else you're using down there, or maybe you're not using anything at all, but get 20% off free shipping with the code OPL at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code OPL at manscaped.com. All right, well, just another uh, job that we get to deep dive or a peek behind the curtain, if you will. Um, yeah, you know, honestly, this is one of those jobs that I feel like I don't really think about too much. Like I said in the beginning, it was kind of, it's usually like a joke that you hear it, like, oh, you're going to call CBS. You know what I mean? It's like, but you you don't really think about what these people are actually doing, you know? I, I It didn't hit me until we were in the middle of that interview that... Some children are just like voiceless. And even when they can talk and comprehend things, they're told by their parents, like, don't say anything or whatever. It can be easily manipulated or yeah. brainwashed into thinking they're totally fine. So they definitely need, you know, a, a third party to stand up for them, you know, and it's, it's great that this thing exists. And, you know, the stuff that she's doing is you know, God's work. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, just like the chain of events that occurs after a call is made, but it seems extremely thorough. And, um, you know, at least in her case, like how seriously she takes it to kind of peel the layers off to get down to like, what is the truth here? And I like that. She said, like, I don't work for the parents. I work for the kids. Yeah. So safety first. Um, but yeah, this is also just insane that she's walking into these situations alone. Yeah, that is, I would have, like, if her husband's listening right now, like, man, we feel for you. That's scary. Dude, you ever scary. see how pissed off people get, like, even on, like, in Instagram comments being like, oh, you shouldn't feed your kid blueberries or something, and they they lose it. So I can't <laughs> imagine walking into someone's house and being like, this is not the proper way to raise a child. Like, people would probably lose their minds, dude. And then yeah. trying to take a child from them, like... That is imagine. a dangerous game. I feel like definitely they should be fucking armed or something <laughs> or know, have right? like a bodyguard with them or, you know what I mean? Like someone or a partner at least. Jesus. Right. Right. Even if it's like, you don't want to, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of like why you wouldn't have like a police officer every time. I guess that's just like a lot of resources to just scope out a situation. Or also maybe we're in America, so it. it's probably a different situation than it is in Canada. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, but that it's just so scary regardless. But yeah. I think, um, yeah, no, just really interesting to see how that works. And I think, you know, her advice, um, at the end was good. It was important. I think just better safe than sorry, uh, is just useful in so many cases. And I think another thing uh, we've definitely talked about on the show, I think for us, you know, we're hearing this side and we've also spoken to people who have been the children in that situation right. who have experienced extreme abuse, violent, sexual. I mean, those are some of the hardest conversations that we have. And you hear those people tell us that they were voicing this or they were telling their parents. And like she said, a parent or a friend or whoever won't take the child seriously, I guess, because they are a child. And I think that's just an important thing to reiterate here is, you know, regardless of the age, like if a child or if anyone is saying anything that could be a cry for help, um, that could be something that just sounds off or uncomfortable. I think it's everyone's duty to take that very seriously and not just brush it off because we've mm -hmm. just heard too many terrible stories about what happens uh, because people brushed off, you know, a child or, or someone saying something. So just yeah. something to reiterate. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, better safe than sorry, obviously. And, uh, you know, I feel like I don't have to say anything else, honestly. I think that kind of encapsulates the entire thing. So uh, for anyone out there, if they want to be a part of the show, uh, hit us up, uh, oplpodcast at gmail.com. We will get back to you and we'll schedule something out. Yeah, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, at OPL Podcast. If you want to become a Patreon member, it's patreon.com slash OPL show. Yes, slash OPL show. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks for listening slash watching. Yep, see you next time.